You know, if you play a lot of games like I assume you do, chances are you enjoy them. You can even tell to an extent by watching footage of a game if it will be fun. But I think there's a really interesting phenomenon where we can tell if a game was fun to make. It's something that is often difficult to put your finger on, but when playing a game there are a collection of details that indicate to you that the developers love the characters, love the stories, and love making games and the product in question. This passion, love, and care that went into Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy is one of the many things that should have been in Avengers. And just just wasn't. From the first hour of gameplay, you can tell they had fun making this game. And as someone who made the poor choice of putting my money into the Avengers game instead of something more fun, like flushing those hard-earned Canadian dollars down the toilet, this was good to see. And now maybe I'm going too far, the Avengers game wasn't that bad, but I thoroughly didn't enjoy it, and I know that this is the consensus across the board, and I really feel like Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy is Square Enix's way of saying, hey, we know we let you down last time, but maybe this will make it up to you? And it does. I want to mention that this video will be spoiler free up to a certain point in which I'll give you a proper warning, but in the meantime everything I show you will be from the first few chapters leading up to the first boss fight, so you don't have to worry about any spoilers. Also if you enjoy these videos you can support me on Patreon by clicking the link in the description. I think an important point to make here right off the bat is that this is not an MCU game, and it has nothing to do with the Marvel Cinematic Universe. This doesn't mean that it doesn't share some of the same aesthetics from the MCU, and it doesn't mean its characters aren't inspired by those depictions, but I only clarify that because a lot of people, including myself can cite their first real exposure of Guardians of the Galaxy to the movie released in 2014. It's also worth noting since it seems like relentlessly hating the MCU movies is really popular right now, so you won't have to worry about any MCU stuff here. But if you are looking for a continuation of the MCU or expecting the characters here to be similar to those featured in the movies, you will be disappointed at first. I say at first because the characters here, while different, were actually more enjoyable than their MCU iterations, and are just as charming as the game's aesthetic itself, which is the only parallel that can be drawn between the games and the movies, thanks to the excellent presentation. This game, for lack of a more professional term, is a vibe. Everything here just screams 80s pop, rock, metal, and cheese, and this is most strictly reinforced by the game's soundtrack, and normally I don't focus on soundtracks, especially not so early in a video, but this needs to be thrown out of the way now. If you are buying this game and planning to stream it, there is a DMCA-free setting which will mute all copyrighted songs, and fortunately the songs that are still present sound great, but do not replace the copyrighted songs. So when you are in an early mission speeding away from a hostile environment listening to I Ran So Far Away, instead of the music setting the tone and allowing the scene to feel like it's right out of a movie, it loses all of its life. It may seem ridiculous to say that the music adds to the scenes this much, but I think if you played this particular scene with both the music on and off, you'll easily be able to tell that this game was built around the soundtrack here. Of course, I would show you an example, but this music is copyrighted and I can't play it without getting demonetized. Which reminds me, another thing that annoys the living hell out of me is that when streaming mode is on, you'll see this distracting message indicating that streaming mode is on, and it's overlaid on everything including cutscenes and the benchmark. It completely pulls you out of the experience, and if missing the nostalgic bops weren't punishing enough, having this message feels almost as though the game is taunting you. It's a constant reminder that you're playing a gimped experience, and I really feel for anyone who streamed this game on their first playthrough. Lastly, I want to mention that I am super biased to this game's soundtrack, because I'm a huge fan of 80s rock and roll, and hearing the likes of Motley Crue and AHA in this game satisfied the living hell out of me. The soundtrack choices here were, as mentioned, great, but they're only so powerful because of their other half, the visuals. The visuals here look great from a fidelity perspective and ran really well too. I saw minor visual glitches, but every cutscene ran smoothly. I did play this on PC, so I can't speak on the console version, so do be warned about that, and as I've been writing the script, it seems the developers have been quite on top of patching out different issues. For example, in this beginning cutscene, the grass looks kinda weird, but when going back now, you'll see even minor issues like this are fixed. All the character designs look great, and they pull plenty of inspiration from the comics and movies. The faces here are actually worth commending the most, because they feel like they have so much life to them, and despite looking very realistic, don't fall into the uncanny valley. The voice acting here is also top notch, and you can tell the actors had a ton of fun recording these lines. Aren't you a little young for the core? Aren't you a little old for that hairdo? <laughs> And specifically, the voice actor for Gamora just killed it here, with her more emotional revelations with the team conveying so much power and life that blows anything from Avengers out of the water. I won't spend this entire video making comparisons to Avengers, but an easy way to spot the difference in quality is by looking at the environments. 
I understand that since Guardians of the Galaxy takes place in outer space, it's going to have access to more eccentric environments, but taking one look at the opening Guardians level, which sees you rummaging through an old planet covered in nano resin, makes any other level from Avengers look terrible in comparison. Even what should be more boring environments like those in the Nova Corps still felt like they had so much life to them, with characters having side conversations and different ambient noises allowing you to feel totally immersed in this world, even if it isn't an open one. An interesting choice that Guardians of the Galaxy made that we don't often see in many other games, let alone superhero ones, is a decision to not include an open world. Think about your favorite modern superhero game. Arkham City, Marvel Spider-Man, Infamous 2, they all have open worlds. Even Avengers, while not having an open world, focused instead on a handful of large battlefields that were quite open and encouraged exploration. Or at least they tried to. With Guardians of the Galaxy, the choice to make a more linear, chapter-based game allows it to feel more concise and lets you move through tight-knit, diverse environments. So many of which just blew me away visually. And I don't think this could have been achieved if the developers were forced to make a full open world for us to fart around in. Instead, the environments are filled with easter eggs, little games to play, and other interactables which encourage me to explore a lot more than a shitty loot box would. Also, okay, last comparison to Avengers, but you know how each individual character in Avengers had a battle pass and you had to play the game like a full-time job to unlock the costumes or work a full-time job in order to afford to outright buy the costumes? Well, Guardians of the Galaxy lets you unlock alternate costumes which all look amazing by just finding them within the levels. Some of these truly do warrant a New Game Plus playthrough as they feature the likes of Quill and the gang donning their MCU suits, demonic supervillain attire, and the selection is extended for Star-Lord even more as he can rock his classic all-denim look from his childhood back home. Surprise that still fits. A small detail like this where they didn't charge for extra suits despite something like this being normalized in today's industry just goes to show that player enjoyment was a top priority. Of course, the only thing that screams style more than a mullet and a denim vest is the huddle up ability. This ability is a really interesting mechanic, but before we dive into its gameplay implications, let's look at the exceptional presentation of this. Even before it starts, you hear the ad lib of a rock and roll warrior just letting you know that the ability is available. When you do activate it, Quill pulls out his cassette player and calls the crew together for a huddle, where they voice any concerns with their impending loss, or let their adrenaline-pumped optimism spill onto the floor. Everyone looks at you to guide them, and when delivering a solid line, the crew gets back in the fight, all while a random song plays on Peter's cassette. It all reeks of those cheesy moments in movies where the underdogs are close to failure, but the captain brings the team back together to hype them up and they win, while a licensed song they spent half the budget on scores the whole scene. This game knows what it is, and it knows what it's trying to be. And man, the ideas here are executed perfectly. Also, delivering a subpar pep talk has hilarious results as the team just awkwardly waltzes back into battle. The different cheesy moments like this really make the game because they make even the more daunting and tedious tasks charming as they're framed in a fun and relaxed way. Does anybody have like a campfire song or something we can sing to kill the time? Ooh, ooh, I know one. It's called... Please stop. All right, yeah. Okay. This makes it far more memorable as the impending doom of the Guardians is contrasted by the happy-go-lucky tunes. Of course, I know presentation isn't everything, as the gameplay matters a hell of a lot too, and it also doesn't disappoint. You may be disappointed at first to know that the game only allows you to play as Peter Quill, and the game really is his story, but you do still control the other Guardians within combat and within a small handful of puzzles. Within exploration, your movements are pretty limited. If the game deems something a walking segment, then your ass is walking. If it's a sprinting segment, you're sprinting, and so on. I think a sprint button could have been really useful, especially for some of the more open environments where you are encouraged to look around at what the environment has to offer, and it could also help a second playthrough feel more fluid. I understand that the reason your movement speed is restricted is because the game doesn't want you to miss out on any dialogue. And that's because the dialogue that takes place is a huge factor in the enjoyment of the game and its cast. Hearing Rocket and Group bicker is funny, despite one of them only using three English words. The dialogue itself is dynamic, too. For example, in the beginning mission, Rocket instructed me to take a path to the left because the path to the right led to a dead end. And because I thought I could be a smart ass and go right anyways, Rocket then berated me and said the following. Uh, you happy, Quill? You found the thing I told you was there, but you didn't listen. A dead end. Uh... Mythical void, death's black terminal. That's it, walk of shame. <sighs> The best part about this, though, is that on the way back, I spotted a pink box which contained one of the many alternate costumes. This here, to me, is such a solid way of teaching the player to maybe take the road less traveled, even if it does lead to some sarcastic comments from the team, because on that walk of shame back to the main path, you might find a nice surprise. The way your team reacts to your actions made the game far more immersive, and actually further encouraged me to venture off the beaten path, because I wanted to see if the team had anything to say, and they always did. Sometimes, in order to get these collectibles, you'll have to make use of your platforming abilities. You have a jump, a double jump, and a 
dash, I can be activated in the air and on the ground. It's not complex, but, and apologies if this is nitpicky, the jumping animation feels really jarring. When pressing the button, you snap into the air and your descent is pretty weighty too, which felt uncanny and it was a little distracting at first. This was the only animation to bother me though, and as mentioned, literally every other animation both in and out of the gameplay looked top notch. While we're on the subject of movement, I appreciated that if the timing was proper, you could chain together dashes and skip the recovery frames, assuming you dashed right as the last dash ended. And I like the reward for precision from the player, even if it may not have been intentional. I know talking about movement and exploration this much could seem unnecessary, but I think it's justified given just how much you do it in the game, and especially in the early chapters. In this first act of the game, combat is really easy and takes a bit of a back seat, which I assume is because the mechanics here can take some getting used to, and they want to ease you into it. The combat here sees you using your two blasters to deal damage to enemies, and at the same time, micromanaging your team, with each team member having strengths and weaknesses. It can be a lot to keep track of at first, but the game does an exceptional job at easing you into it, even if there are quite a few pop-ups explaining mechanics. I think these pop-ups are okay though because the mechanics here are really simple, but it's the sheer amount of them to keep track of that gives the game its challenge. That's also why you'll notice as far as enemies are concerned, it's usually a bunch of weaker enemies that overpower you in numbers rather than one big enemy, though the big enemies are here mixed in with the many small fries. Controlling Peter is simple in combat. You have your dash to dodge out of the way, your double jump, and your blasters which have elemental variants you can swap between on the fly. I only wish that swapping between the different variants were a little snappier, as it could have led to greater flow in combat and greater rewards for quick swapping. Regardless, a lot of enemies will have shields that are weak to something like ice, for example, and will need to be hit with that element before they can be damaged. Other enemies will just be flat out weak to something like electricity, and hitting them with their weakness will lead to increased damage and a faster buildup of their stagger bar. This bar positioned under the enemy's health bar will fill up gradually as you do damage, and even more so if that damage comes from their weakness. Once full, the enemy will be staggered and open for a larger attack that usually features each member of the team taking slices at the enemy, dealing huge damage. Using an enemy's weakness to stagger them will be integral to taking down the beefier foes, but taking care of the crowds of smaller enemies will require the proper elemental mods and the use of your team. Each member of the team has something to contribute here. Groot plays a support role, trapping his enemies in roots and healing the guardians. Drax and Gamora play a single target damage role that allows them to do insane damage, but to only one or maybe a few targets. And Rocket, on the other hand, is great for crowd control and heavy DPS across the board. Peter's abilities are a good mix of both. Some see you floating in the air thanks to your rocket boots, allowing you to avoid any melee-based enemies, and others see you focusing damage on one enemy or spreading that damage across a large group. I only wish that the Guardians here had some more defining traits and abilities. Aside from group playing support, all the Guardians have moves that cover crowd control, single enemy DPS, and while these abilities are useful, I found myself not caring what Guardian got the job done. Rather, it was a matter of who was available. If we were to ever get a sequel, which god, I fucking want one. I'd love to see the crew have different skill sets that require some more thought from the player. Rocket could, like his character, be tech-based and create traps for enemies to walk into. Or he could craft different grenades that apply different elemental damage. The elemental rounds on Peter's guns are limited and sometimes you don't have enough ammo to stagger an enemy and using one of Rocket's freeze grenades could solve this problem. Or maybe there are a bunch of smaller enemies with shields that need to be shot with electric rounds to become vulnerable. An electric grenade from Rocket would be the solution. Gamora could be focused entirely on crowd control, and Drax could be used for focusing just one enemy. While the Guardians themselves may not have too many defining features, what they do have here is a lot of fun, and combining the many members together is amazing. An integral skill you'll need to beat this game, especially on the harder difficulties, is commanding the team to work in tandem with one another. Nothing is more efficient, flashy, and satisfying than wrapping up 10 goons in Groot's vines, which increases the amount of damage they take, just to have Rocket toss out a grenade to obliterate all of them thanks to its area of effect damage. This is why I wanted even more diversity in the cast moveset, because working together as a team is a major theme in the plot and reflecting that within the game is integral, and it would make gameplay more fun. I loved having a huge target with multiple health bars being wrapped down by Groot's vines and then having every guardian focus their attention on this target and it was some of the most fun I had in this game. All of this is done while you avoid the attacks coming your way too, which, if dodged with perfect timing, will slow down time. So in any given fight, you'll be shooting enemies, managing the team, dodging shots that come your way, making sure you're using the right elemental rounds, and I think you get it, it's a lot, but it's not too much. This aforementioned perfect dodge is one of the upgrades you can unlock for Peter by grabbing materials around the world. These upgrades are pretty basic, but mesh well with the gameplay. Things like instead of letting your blasters cool down after using them, you can press the trigger about a quarter of the way through the cooldown period to not only replenish your ammo, but to also send out a stronger blast. So while on its own the upgrade doesn't do much, it does reward you for playing with more rhythm and focus, and the same goes for the perfect dodge. There are also some basic shield and health upgrades, and some are obviously more valuable than others, but I like these upgrades as they add a little spice to the gameplay every now and then. There are also a ton of choices here for accessibility and difficulty, allowing you to tweak individual mechanics and their recharge rates, and seeing this was great and made future playthroughs more interesting. 
So while the rocket boots on the ground combat here is good, there is a little space combat sprinkled into gameplay too, and it was surprisingly good. The controls came easy and you're equipped with some basic blasters and some limited missiles. Taking out enemies was never too complex because there are about 20 minutes of total space combat in the game. And my only real half criticism is that I found myself getting disoriented sometimes within the environments, but I only call this a half criticism because I think I just suck, but I don't know, I'm sure you can let me know in the comments. When it comes to piloting the other guardians in the environment, you'll make use of their very situational abilities. Things like Peter's blasters can be used to switch currents, freeze water, seal pipes, melt ice walls, and so on. Others like Amora can cut things in the environment, Drax can lift heavy things, Groot can make bridges and raise platforms, and Rocket can slip into tiny spaces and hack control panels. It all just boiled down to coming across an obstacle and figuring out which button to press and eventually considering how easy it was to spot, you would get to a point where these obstacles don't stop you at all because you press the corresponding button the second you see it. So it makes it hard for me to give any real in-depth thoughts because they're so short and they come around only ever so often and any criticisms I could have are pretty well nullified. Maybe the elevator portion in Chapter 7 could have been shorter. Either way, they just act as a way to continue the feedback loop while in between the different combat set pieces. So of course, the enemies and the ways we take them all down are good. But what about the boss fights? Well, they're just as good as the rest of the game, and while some are much better than others, and I don't think they broke any molds, they are worth talking about. I need to warn you though, this is where this video enters spoiler territory. If you need my final thoughts on the game, you should buy it. It was so much fun, and after completing the game, I immediately went back for a new game plus. Its combat certainly isn't the most deep, and the gameplay as a whole isn't anything revolutionary, but its environment, soundtrack, characters, and just about everything else in the game is just as exceptional, and it all comes together to make a game truly greater than the sum of its parts, and it's more than worth your money and time. I should mention that this game is relatively beefy too, as it'll take you around 15 hours to finish, and that's assuming you didn't die, explore, try New Game Plus, or any of that. So with that out of the way, if you have liked what you have seen so far, you know what to do. And I know some of you rascals are just going to keep watching anyway, so if that's the case, then tap out right when you feel convinced. And for those of you that are still here and want to see what I think of the boss fights level design and story, let's jump back in. The first boss fight you go toe to toe with, or in this case, toe to tentacle, is Lady Hellbender's squid thing? I don't know what it is. It's called the, like the Dweller in Darkness or something, but it doesn't really narrow down what it is. This guy is defeated by beating up his limbs and then shooting a weak point. As the fight moves into its second phase, you'll need Drax to throw something at it, and that's it. It wasn't very deep, but it's the first boss fight, so I can't fault it too much. The second boss fight against the Blood Brothers had an interesting concept where you had to get them separated to do damage, but again, this wasn't super deep or challenging. You'll notice this theme carries throughout the game. One of the final fights in the game is against Fing Fang Foom, which is actually teased on a few occasions leading up to this point, and I don't think it disappointed. Need a plan, and reconsider my initial proposal. Oh, no, not Fin Fang Foom again. Yes, we should go after Fin Fang Foom. Drax, there are easier ways to get paid. Foom has a few attacks, all of which took some good timing to dodge. One saw him breathing fire into the air and having the individual fireballs crash down on the arena, which required some quick thinking. The dragon is taken down by just waiting for a particular attack that leaves a massive ice shard on the field, and it can be thrown into Foom, leaving him temporarily vulnerable. I think the only issue I have with this fight is that the pace of the battle is not reliant on the player, but rather the boss itself and its scripted segments. The first time I figured out what to do with Foom, I felt rewarded, but the way you defeat him never changes, so by the third time I threw the ice shard at him, I didn't really feel anything. Thing. Otherwise, this fight was great for the scale and story implications. Another late game fight was against Raker, and it was okay. I wasn't huge on it because while the attacks he throws at the Guardians do increase in scale and damage, the way you defeat him doesn't. That's not to say there wasn't fun to be had here, as there was, but for a final fight, I wanted something more than just wailing away on a large health bar, three times over. Within the narrative, this works great, but that's mostly as far as it gets and that goes for Magus too. I wonder if my expectations are too high for a fight like this, as it seems like a final victory lap of sorts for the Guardians, but there wasn't really a fight here. It was just endless waves of ever-increasing enemies and not even tough ones at that. I understand that this isn't necessarily meant to be a final tough as nails boss fight, and considering it even takes place after the final walk down the aisle, I can't fault it that much. But narratively speaking, it was fine, and gameplay speaking, it was just okay. I mentioned gameplay a lot here, but I feel like I've been giving a misleading presentation of the game up to this point. Because for every combat section and boss fight, there is an interesting puzzle, a neat gameplay gimmick that doesn't overstay its welcome, or a story-driven flashback. The thing is, these moments made the game for me, as they were yet another testament to just how much player enjoyment was a priority during development. It was always a surprise to see what was going to happen next. Taking on endless waves of Thanos clones was something I'd never see in a AAA game like this, yet here we are. My absolute favorite was when Drax is taken by the promise and the crew are locked in their rooms, and in order to unlock the door, they have to lead a space llama to the override switch. How can they do that? By singing! Because as established in an earlier conversation with the crew, the llama hates Gamora's singing and will be repelled by it. Come on, sing it! Shooting at the walls of... 
But those with a good voice will attract the llama. Everyone singing Don't Worry Be Happy is such a lovable moment of dumb fun that while mechanically is one of the most bare gameplay portions of the game, it was just wholesome and enjoyable, as is a lot of other gameplay mechanics. Such as when you're leaving nowhere, if you failed to snap Cosmo out of the promise and he'll send you into a psychological gulag. One of his puppies who hasn't been taken uses his barks to guide you out and the only issue I had with this was that hearing the direction that the barks were coming from was sometimes really difficult. But regardless, even small detours like this are given so much care and treated so well. By the way, failing to save Cosmo at this point is a result of dialogue choices you've made throughout the game. If you were able to save Cosmo, then you skip the gulag entirely and he will instead help you in the final battle. There are plenty of things like this in the game. When first meeting Nikki, if you decide to befriend her and gain her trust, she'll give you a device that gives her access to the entire ship, making your return to it even easier as you can bypass all the locks and puzzles. Another, like the world mind, if properly convinced to help the guardians, does a ton of damage to what would otherwise be an insane combat encounter, making it beyond manageable and it serves as a great reward for making the right decisions. If you don't convince the world mind, then they just don't show up. There are even decisions that happen outside of gameplay, and your party members have realistic reactions to them. There are the smaller ones, like when you head off the beaten path and the crew calls you a loon, but there are some larger ones, like when Gamora wants to split off from the group and take a stab at Raker, and we're just thrusted into combat. In this split second, I didn't want Gamora to go alone, so I jumped to the platform where she was standing, and because we were too heavy, the platform collapsed and she wasn't able to get a shot in at Raker. And she was furious with us. If we choose to let her go, she ends up taking Raker's arm before reuniting with the group, making his boss fight significantly easier. The split second decision made her treat us like shit for upwards of three chapters and I gotta say I love when little moments like this spin out of control. All of these choices just made me even more inclined to make different decisions on New Game Plus just to see what I missed because in chapter 6 for example, choosing to sell Groot or Rocket results in different environments entirely and basically new missions. Finally we can get to the overarching narrative that while taking a backseat to the individual characters is still pretty front and center, as it's flawlessly interlaced with Peter's internal conflict. I also feel that my enjoyment of this particular portion of the game is validated since this game won best narrative, and it wouldn't have been able to do that without such a great story. The plot begins with a young Peter sitting in his bedroom jamming out on his birthday until interrupted by his mother. Before we can do much else though, we are woken up by the thousand yard staring destroyer of dreams, Drax, who informs Peter that they have reached their destination and still has some concerns about their newest member, the very deadly Gamora. Along the way we get introduced to our snarky rat rocket and my sleep paralysis demon Groot, and next thing we know we're waltzing through a quarantine planet and picking up scrap to sell for credits. When poking around the crew come across what looks like a soul stone, and out of it pops a large black creature and it spooks the team quite a bit, but I'm sure it's nothing. On the way out, the place begins to collapse and it draws the attention of the Nova Corps and their captain, ex-girlfriend of Space Lord, Corel. but they were together 12 years ago so it doesn't really matter. As they board the ship, they're escorted by a rather tiny looking officer named Nikki. After an explosion sends Nikki and Peter overboard, the two get to know one another and we figure out that her mother is actually Peter's ex-girlfriend. And to make matters worse, Nikki's 12. Once reuniting with Corel, the team is set free to pay their bounty of 8,000 credits. In order to scheme their way out of it, they decide to sell either Rocket or Groot to Lady Hellbender, as they are both extremely rare creatures. Once they're caught after being paid, the crew barely escapes and now both the police and bandits are on their tail. As they escape, they get a distress signal from the Nova Corps ship from earlier, and they return to find it ravaged and taken over by officers who all seem to be hypnotized. As the crew escapes, they seek the help of Cosmo the dog, and when further investigating the strange hypnotism, the team discovers that it's due to one grand unit Fire Raker, who has Nikki and has turned her into some kind of matriarch. Nikki, upon being confronted by the crew, shows them something called the Promise. The Promise is a hypnosis of sorts that allows those who accept it to live within their own mind, and their faith is then turned into energy. It tailors itself to the individual. So, for example, Drax gets to be with his family, and Peter gets to save his mother, as we find out that she tragically died thanks to the Chitari. As more people accept the Promise, the Church's power grows, and it could spell the end of the universe. Thankfully, none of the Guardians accept. It. Along the way, we find out that Corel went to investigate the quarantine zone and was killed by the alien, and Nikki knows this. The crew escape from Nikki and Raker, but Drax seems to have accepted the promise, and he takes the crew to the home of Mantis, who decides to help the Guardians and guide them through a cave, allowing them to save Drax by entering his mind and with the added help of Adam Warlock, save him. Warlock explains that the black alien from earlier is actually his other half, Magus, and that it was sealed inside the Mind Stone before the crew released it. Magus is controlling Raker and the church with hopes of acquiring enough faith energy to assume a physical form, which would be the de facto end of the galaxy. Warlock helps the crew track down Raker again, but he barely escapes. And with nowhere to turn, the crew decides to enlist the help of the still very pissed off Lady Hellbender, and captures Fing Fang Foom, presenting it to her as a peace offering. 
With her help, the crew launch a final assault on Raker and save Nikki by forcing her to accept her mother's death, and the crew finds out that in fact Nikki isn't even Peter's daughter. Raker is then killed, and Warlock consumes Magus within him. The galaxy has now been officially guarded, and the crew takes a final walk of fame to celebrate. Not all is well, however, as Magus corrupts Warlock, leading to a final battle. With Magus eventually recaptured within the Soul Stone, Peter has to contemplate on how he'll be able to take care of Nikki, and that's basically where the adventure ends. Easily the best part of the story here is, funny enough, not even the story it's trying to tell. Sure, the promise in Peter Quill's journey is great, and the set pieces like fighting the different apparitional Thanos is... or... or... Thani? Uh, point is, that's all good, but the dialogue and plots that take place in between are exemplary. The Guardians never shut up, and it was so rare to hear repeated lines, and while it seems like a bad thing, and let's be honest, in most cases this is a bad thing, there's something so authentic about the delivery and even the topics of discussion here that make it great. It's very reminiscent of a gang of friends shooting the shit about any topic from something trivial like this. Hellbender's castle isn't even that far! And it's not a castle, it is an impregnable fortress. So how do we impregnate it? Peter! <laughs> Let's just get closer! We'll figure it out on the way! To questioning and even eventually mocking the possibility of Peter being a father. Gotta admit it, Quill. Kid's whole setup is pretty impressive. The way she rigged her terminal to the emergency power grid. I told you, she's a smart kid. Perhaps Peter Quill did not sire this child after all. Yeah, I could see that. She just don't seem dopey enough. Maybe she gets everything from the mother's side. Okay, Drax is clearly onto something, so let's all just go with that. It's the most nothing dialogue I've heard in a game, and it works far better than it does in other games I try to do the same thing. Just because there are a lot of fun in games here doesn't mean the individual Guardians don't have their tender moments too. Chatting with Drax about his family that he lost in the war and the truth that he actually didn't kill Thanos and how it haunts him was really touching, and uncovering the trauma with Gamora from being the daughter of the Mad Titan was just as interesting. We also get to know more about Rocket's tragic backstory. And who could forget about Groot? I mean... He is Groot. All of these stories, while not overshadowing the main plot, really helped develop the party members, and while some, like Gamora's childhood, were far more interesting than Rocket's fear of water, they were all interesting to an extent. And I shouldn't write off Rocket's backstory, because there is more to it. Rocket being a living science experiment is what gave him his fear of water, as it seemed to be some kind of post-traumatic stress, but I think the way it was handled in the game was just not as good as the others. I mean, one is waiting for Rocket to swim through a tight space to save the crew as one by one they falter, and another is taking down infinite Thanos, clones. Need I say more? I've talked a lot about the Guardians here, but I do think the side characters that accompany you are just as good. For starters, we can look to Mantis, who is arguably the funniest character here. For comparison's sake, my first exposure to Mantis was her depiction in the MCU, and I remembered her as an intelligent psychic of sorts. Here, she is just the biggest lovable idiot, and I found it hilariously charming. Hi, guys. You should not be in this place. Actually, I'm exactly where I need to be, I think. I understand that her incessant too dumb for her own good dialogue, all of which ends in a high-pitched tone to infer that it might be a question, could get on some players' nerves. But within this game's tone, I think it's awesome. Others like Lady Hellbender and Corel were fine. They served their purpose well enough, and their dialogue, while short, was still well delivered. I wish I had more to say about these folks, but they were often subject to being a wall of sorts for the rest of the gang to bounce funny dialogue off of. Fortunately, a character I think was meant to fill the same role as these guys was Cosmo the dog, and he fails in spectacular fashion, as every time this textbook good boy is on screen, he completely steals the show. He's such a scruffy little genius, and his many rambles about puppies and psychological gulags were exceptionally cute, and he ends up being one of my favorite characters. Adam Warlock was a pretty enjoyable nutjob too, that again just serves as kind of joke fodder for the rest of the crew. I think something important to note here is that while the game's side characters don't have much of their own stories to tell, I think that's okay. I mean, we have five main characters here, three of which have pretty in-depth backstories, so it makes sense that there just isn't room to expand on Lady Hellbender's backstory and motivations. Besides, even if they did expand on it, I'm not sure if it would have fit in with the game's tone or if it would have ruined the pacing, so I think having it the way it is now was the right call. Nikki, on the other hand, while being a kind of antagonist, was one of the better characters. I do wish we could have seen a greater downfall for her, though, as in one scene she's on our side, and in the very next she is fully indoctrinated into the cult. It's funny because we actually learn the most about Nikki not when we're talking to her, but when we're following her tracks, such as when rummaging through her room to find clues of her whereabouts. We find that she is incredibly tech-inclined and enamored by the prospect of meeting her father, which is enforced by her continuing struggle with her mother. We learn that for only being 12, the kid's a brainiac, which makes us further question if she could 
could really be the daughter of this lovable dumbass. Which, by the way, she isn't. It turns out that during the war, she was to be executed, but Corel saved her and passed her off as her own daughter. If anyone found out that Nikki wasn't a true Kree, then both of them would be executed. It not only takes a huge weight off of Peter's shoulders, but it also serves as a noble revelation for Corel. Strangely enough, Peter ends up being her father anyways, because by the end of the plot, despite looking like a human torch, she has nowhere to go. And Peter is already in the father mindset, even if his approach is just as humorously immature as his approach to anything else. It's funny, because as far as villains go, both Magus and Raker aren't very exciting or really deep, but they both do their job well enough, and much like the side characters, they take a backseat of sorts to the main conflict of the game, which is the internal struggle within the Guardians. While I think Raker could have been far more menacing, it's easy to forgive when such amazing characters are here from those front and center like Mantis, to even those on the sidelines like Cosmo, who pick up the slack any day. As far as pacing goes, I think the game dragged a bit during Chapter 14, where we have to make our way through the outside and inside of Raker's base, but through a gameplay lens, this was one of my favorite levels. It was just wave after wave of enemies, allowing you to finally make use of all of your abilities, because keen players will have almost all of the upgrades by the time this mission rolls around. And it was the peak of the gameplay for me. Not to mention the hilariously cheesy shot of Peter getting a secret weapon back. Are you gonna be okay? Yeah. That was just so... Metal? Let's take everything we've evaluated here and try to come to some sort of conclusion. I'll take you to the stars. I'll show you who we are. Overall, Guardians of the Galaxy surprised me, and I think just about everyone else. Its presentation was on par, if not better looking than today's standards, and while its gameplay lacked anything super deep for its individual characters, controlling five characters at once was where the fun and challenge came from, as you had to manage the different members as well as your own tactics as Quill. It was less about what you have to do and more about how much of it you have to get done while staying alive. And while I agreed that playing as each character individually would have been amazing, I'm more than happy with what we got, as it's a smaller scale ambition that is executed beautifully, especially when compared to what the latter could have been. And that's only the combat. The level design itself was also exceptional with environments that never failed to astound me, and the different minigames and little puzzles also helped carry the game between its vast set pieces with a charming elegance that a lot of games can't replicate. The game story was pretty good, but the characters themselves really stole the show here. Learning of the individual characters made me care more about them, and the fact we get to see all sides of the different characters as their relaxed, fun combat interactions contrast their past was far more engaging than the already engaging narrative with The Promise and Nikki. Even if the main characters didn't do it for you, the side characters definitely will. You know, it's crazy, because I had only bought this game because a few people were telling me how great it was, and I'd assumed that these praises were hyperbolic, because let's be real, anything compared to Avengers looks like Game of the Year. But these people's statements were clearly disconnected from the Avengers comparison, because while this game, when standing next to Avengers, looks like a masterpiece, when isolated, it stands on its own as a fun, character-driven experience with gameplay to keep the player engaged, and a soundtrack sure to give you whiplash with all the nostalgic headbangers. On a far more personal note, I think one of the biggest things I appreciate about Guardians of the Galaxy is that it feels like the good old days where you had tight-knit levels with interesting environments, fun secrets and collectibles, a solid style and aesthetic outside of hyper-realism. For the last few years now, I've seen AAA Western gaming move in the same direction. It feels like every game these days is some fucking open world, man. With a mini-map you can't even read until you grab all the collectibles that boil down to following a waypoint to a location, and missions that lose weight because they all take place in an open world you already know too well thanks to the overwhelming amount of side content. I know that I love a lot of the guilty games I am showing on screen right now, and I'm not saying that these games are bad at all but eventually it gets tiring seeing what feels like the same shit over and over. Open world, skill trees, yada yada, and while it's fun, I have been dying for something that goes back to the basics and feels like what I grew up playing. This game has no microtransactions, no bullshit, and while I understand that microtransactions and season passes shouldn't and don't affect my thoughts on a game at its core, but it affects my thoughts on the game's intentions. For example, if you look at the new Call of Duty and you see that, yeah, there was some effort put into making a campaign and some fun multiplayer, but across the game's life, Span, it feels like more effort gets put into different microtransactions and skin packs for you to buy than anything else. It is just a constant reminder that this is a product that is trying to make as much money as possible. Guardians feels like it was mostly concerned with just making a kick-ass game. Sure, it's still full price and I wouldn't expect it or want it to be anything cheaper, but the lack of any aforementioned monetization allows this game to stick out in my mind as something I not only enjoy, but respect the living hell out of. You can tell that whoever the beautiful people are that made this game loved it. And damn it, I love it too. 
Hello. Thanks for watching this. It is 2022 now. I'm recording this uh, outro on January 1st. I'm hoping to have the video out soon. I just want to say thank you to our patrons and our YouTube members. We actually gained a lot of YouTube members. Breeze Over, Daniel Latau, and Lane. And uh, thank you guys for supporting me. I really appreciate it. And thank you to the patrons as well. Thank you to Arthur Bynum, Evan, TJ Clark, Toyota Jeff, Chris, Ben Conway, Thomas Jones, Mark Short, Gonzo Gonzalez, Alfednar845719, Nathan Figs, Chiefy, Bossian, and Pyrites. Your support really means the world to me, and I also want to say that as of recording this video, I am at 99,400 subscribers, and that's really scary because that's close to 100, and I hope I make it there. And if I do, I'll probably do a little live stream, and I'll probably do like a little video saying thanks, and then we will continue forward uh, business as usual. As far as the new year goes, I think uh, I'm going to try and finish the Assassin's Creed games. I think I'm just going to try and take some more time on my videos, like just try and put more time into the scripts. I think the editing is pretty solid, I like to think. Obviously, there's things that could be improved, but I think my weakest strength right now, or weakest strength, wow. Uh, I think my weakest aspect right now of my videos is definitely the scripts, and I think they need to be better, and I'm going to try and achieve that. I think that is it. If you could go follow my Twitter, that would be cool. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for watching. I appreciate it. I love you guys. Stay safe, stay healthy, and take care.